we, we find uh, a lot of, even in, you know, early medieval art in the West, a lot of really dramatic and uh, kind of uh, outlandish scenes. So in, in the Middle Ages, you do, you do have a lot of illuminated manuscripts of the life of St. Anthony. Uh, I have one here, I believe. St. Anthony uh, being uh, harassed by uh, a lobster devil. I think it's important to remember, though, I think I think one of the reasons why Anthony's story um, is something that um, is treasured in a very special way is that Anthony's dates, he's what, born around 250 something. So he's born into basically the most vicious, he's, he's, he's going to come of age during the most vicious persecution of mm. all. And he escapes, you know, the Diocletian persecutions, he escapes sort of the death throes of the Roman Empire trying to crush the Christians. And then he lives through the peace of Constantine and and he is very, very, very important for people post peace of Constantine. And this is why I think Athanasius writes his life so quickly. Right. And the How Arian you crisis saint if you're not getting martyred too. anymore. Yeah. It's, and then so so there there are two very important things that are happening here. One, there is the problem of saintliness and holiness without that martyr witness like what is it's obvious why 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 sebastian and agnes and 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 lawrence are saints but how do you do it if you're not being thrown to the lions mm. that's question number one question number two that is again incredibly significant is that as soon as christianity is legalized the first thing that happens is everybody shows up and says oh yes i'm so it's so easy to be christian now let me explain to you what christian is and you have this age of tremendous heresies i mean the arian heresy is just the tip of the iceberg so you have completely conflicting confusing doctrines about how you are to be holy, who is Jesus and how you're supposed to follow him. And in a certain sense, Anthony's simplicity, he closes out the noise. It's like someone, he's like the first guy to like turn off Facebook and Twitter and be like, I'm just not listening. I'm just going to try to listen to the voice of God. And so even though he tries to remove the outside noise of this age of heresies, the reminder is that trying to separate yourself from situations of sin, trying to separate yourself from the confusion, doctrinal confusion, temptation is always going to find you. Mm -hmm. So you need a better center, better than a geographic center, better than a literary center. You just, you need a center. And that center is Jesus. In the case of Anthony, it's very clear in the art. Yeah. And so the fact that he's abused and attacked by demons, often in the, in the form of wild beasts, makes him a good you know analog to these as you said martyrs you know being being eaten by lions and things like that uh it it, it takes on another form but there's there's a very clear uh line between them and him in the form in which his his struggles most famously uh took place he's right. he's being attacked it, and, and lions specifically figure in uh, as well so it, it, and it also helps that it parallels um, Jesus's preparation for his mission, right? So Jesus, before he takes on the fullness of his mission of salvation, what does he do? He goes off to the desert. And there in the desert, he is tempted. And so having this figure who, who, who mirrors Jesus's experience of temptation in the desert is also extremely important. And then we bring out this, this array of creatures, lions, of course, lions, of course, have a meaning for the Christians, but I think it's good to remember that they're really, they're thrown ad bestias. So they're thrown to virtually, if it, if it, choose and eats the christians are going to be thrown to them mm -hmm. and so this idea of 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 being thrown to these demons in the in the form of beasts and that kind of the very first part of 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 anthony's imagery really are these very i don't want to say simple icons but they're just very straightforward this is a guy who you can talk to about finding a holy life. Here's his face. Here's his little monk's hat. Mm -hmm. Here's his little Tau cross. He might have his little, you know, some little object. He's got a million. His, his story is so complex. He's got a million different attributes. So, you know, it's each it, the artist gets to pick off the shelf which sure. of those attributes he wants to use. And uh, and then we get to these, these medieval illuminators who... Um, you know, really, they're just illuminating a little part of a page, but they like to do it in this very fanciful way. And Anthony lends himself magnificently to that. So you can you can do an illumination that isn't 
quite so random. Right. It's not quite so, well, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'll stick something here. But you can actually tell an edifying story in that space. And that's a really, really helpful way of making sure the story of, of Anthony gets a kind of second push, a second wave into, into society. And I find it very intriguing, the use of these animals. Now, it's true the story of Athanasius tells us about you know, an array of different beasts. And when we look at the golden legend, which is going to reboot the story of Anthony for the Middle Ages, we hear beasts galore and lions and howling and scratching and you, know, you name it. But what's very, very interesting is the use of animal symbolism in the history of art and literature. Mm -hmm. And if you go all the way back to the Greeks, the Greeks have a way of describing human beings who allow themselves to be taken over by their sensuality, by their senses, by their instincts, by their desires as half man, half animal. So you've all heard of centaurs. That's rage when you become so angry, you can't really articulate. Uh, you've heard of the, the, the satyr, which is lust. And that memory of what it's like to be this kind of in prey of instinct to the point where you are nothing more than an animal remains. And as you move towards this period of the Middle Ages, you find these very interesting scribes in the monasteries creating these part these, these these chimeric characters that are drawing together things that are from nature and yet they are a pollution and a perversion of nature and this is wrestling with the problem that it's natural to that love is natural we think of we think of falling in love wanting to eat uh, wanting to be with the one we love as something natural but taken to the point where that leads you, it becomes unnatural, it becomes something that's that's more debauched or perverse. And so they play around with that idea in the manuscripts. And then in the 14th century, they just go nuts with them in the painting. So you just have this incredible array of images where the artists are just playing with this idea. 